We're talking about the resurrection tonight. Uh, the resurrection is super important. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So really important. Um, and because it's so important, Christianity literally stands or falls in the resurrection. A lot of people have spilled ink over the last 20 years trying to defend the historicity of the resur resurrection. And so two of the big arguments you'll hear are uh, N.T. Wright's argument and also uh, Michael Kona slash Gary Habermas's argument. <clears throat> and these are both really good arguments. So N.T. Wright's, uh, if you were here for Veritas Forum, you heard Molly Worthen talking about the big book she read. This is the author of the book. Uh, and so his argument works by, he kind of goes through all the beliefs of the resurrection uh, within the early first century Jewish beliefs and also beliefs in the kind of Greek Hellenistic world. And what Wright does, he demonstrates that the Christian belief in a resurrected Messiah cannot be explained as merely an adaptation of any of those views. Um, so you have to, the only possible explanation is a bodily resurrection of Jesus. So that's Wright's approach. It's very good. The other approach is the habermas lacona approach, and this is what's called the minimal facts argument. And this takes a set of three facts that are attested by uh, the majority of Christian and atheist scholars, and it argues from those facts to <clears throat> the best reasoning of the resurrection as the best possible explanation. And so these are both really good arguments. And if you want to talk about the resurrection, you need to engage with these. So you should check them out if you haven't. Uh, but the question that they're fundamentally interested in is, did the resurrection happen? They're not interested in the question, are the gospel accounts true? So this might seem like a distinction without a difference. But in terms of argumentation and how it works, it's actually pretty substantial. So when Wright, Lacone, and Habermas are trying to argue for the resurrection, they're trying to do it in the most uh, um, efficient, airtight way possible. And so this means like avoiding any possible rabbit trails or any more controversy than is absolutely necessary. Because you're already arguing for a resurrection, right? So you want to kind of minimize um, your areas that people will disagree with you because you're already arguing for something that's kind of unbelievable. Um, so in practice, this means that uh, these people minimize their engagement with the Gospels because the Gospels are kind of suspect in the scholarly world. Um, but I'm willing to bet that many of us in this room are probably some flavor of evangelical, and we all have some belief in like the inerrancy or the sufficiency of scripture. And so instinctively, we had this reaction that we want to believe uh, the resurrection because the gospel said it's true. Um, but the question we need to ask is, can we do this within uh, you know, modern New Testament scholarship and how it's evolved within the last uh, 100 years or so? And so this is a guy by the name of Dan McClellan. Uh, he's a somewhat well-known like, scholar of religion. He's become more famous recently for his TikToks. He enjoys making people mad. So um, he's kind of provocative. Uh, but his views are kind of a good litmus test for what a lot of the more critical uh, New Testament scholars will say. So McClellan says, the data indicate that there are no eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life in the New Testament. The state of the field acknowledges that a close reading of the Gospels does not turn up a single first-person claim to being an eyewitness to Jesus' life. So, does this statement make any of y'all a little bit uncomfortable? Right? Our whole understanding of the Gospels, right, is that it's the eyewitness testimony of Jesus' life. And so McClellan is saying, this is not what's going on in the Gospels. He's saying it's not based on eyewitness testimony that we all would probably consider it would be. So this uh, makes us kind of uncomfortable, and it can cast doubt on the whole gospel narrative, and especially the resurrection, because if there's no eyewitness testimony in the whole gospels, then there's no eyewitness testimony in the resurrection accounts. Um, so this leaves us with the question, is there any historical basis to believe that the accounts of Jesus' resurrection and the gospels are true? Jet. Yes, so there, there is technically claims of eyewitness testimony, but McClellan disputes all the claims. Um, so like the Gospel of John, uh, and then also like the prologue to Luke, he'll dispute that. So um, kind of a priori ruling out a lot of the evidence. But that's a, that's a separate discussion. Um, but yeah, so but the, the, the point is that many of the scholars in the New Testament will say that they are not eyewitness testimony. 
Um, so this is kind of what I want to dive into tonight. Um, I want to focus specifically on the question of where the resurrection accounts come from, right? Uh, can we trust the resurrection accounts? Can we legitimately say that they're the testimony of eyewitnesses? Uh, like, what do these accounts portray themselves as? Uh, and how would someone in the first century read these texts? And so these are the questions I'm, kind of di I'm going to dive into. I'm not going to address like, the bigger question of, did the resurrection happen? But this is a kind of a smaller subset of that same question. It's highly related. So here's a brief outline. First, uh, I want to do some quick uh, background on like, your Greco-Roman world and some kind of context that's good to help us as we interpret the Gospels. Uh, and then I'll dive into my contentions. So first, I'm going to argue that the synoptic resurrection accounts portray themselves as having derived from eyewitness testimony. Uh, and then I'm going to argue uh, that the synoptic resurrection accounts represent a very early form of Christian tradition. Uh, and so you might notice I'm limiting my discussion to the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm not going to engage with the Gospel of John, not because I don't like the Gospel of John, but because if you talk about the Gospel of John, you're going to end up in all sorts of weird rabbit holes that kind of distract you from the main discussion. Uh, so we're just going to be focusing on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, so let's get started. Does this chart look familiar to anyone? Yeah. It's been a couple months, so if it's rusty, no worries. But okay, can someone tell me what this chart means? What, what is it saying? What's the idea here? True, yes. So this was, this was the uh, chart that Zach did in his presentation on comparative lit, right? Reading outside the Bible to understand what's inside the Bible. Uh, and so it talks about this is how communication works in cultures. And so the example that Zach used was really good. It was a Pinocchio. So I'll just rehash it again just so we can all be on the same page. So if you send me a text and I send you an emoji back with the long nose, what, is that, what am I telling you? Yeah, I'm calling you a liar. How do we know that, right? Because in our head, we have this idea of the story of Pinocchio and how this wood carving came to life, and then when he told a lie, his nose grew. And so our whole culture understands this, but it wouldn't make sense to anyone that like, didn't know the story of Pinocchio. But it's, it's so like, uh, foundational to, like, I guess, some of our ways we interpret things, right? And so the idea is that communication happens within a cognitive environment, within a culture. And so the author will say something that's interpreted in terms of a shared world, and the audience can extrapolate the message. So this works in things like figures of speech, kind of like the Pinocchio, but also in like larger structures. So if you think how stories are told in our culture, we have a very particular way of telling stories. So if you think about the genre of superhero movie, like what makes a superhero movie? There's a set of characteristics in a superhero movie, right? Maybe an origin story or like a fight on the top of a skyscraper. And every type of, every type of superhero movie is going to have kind of these tropes. And they make sense to us because we're familiar with the genre of superhero movie. And this is why like spoofs make sense, right? Because parodies are playing off our ideas of what makes a good superhero movie. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, and so the same thing applies in the ancient world. They had their own genres of like tragedies and comedies, and they had tropes that were familiar to the audience, but maybe not be familiar to those outside of the shared cognitive environment or the shared world. And so this also works not just in stories, but in how history is written. So when we talk about how history has been written down across different periods of time, this is called the study of historiography, how history has been written down throughout history. Because the way we write, things, the way we write history down changes. So we change the style it's written in, what conventions are going to be used, what techniques are going to be used. And so we have a certain way we write history. So when we think about this, let's think about how we write history today. So how many people have read like a modern academic work of history ever? OK, a good number of you. So what kind of things would we expect to find in like a modern history work? What kind of characteristics? Factual accuracy, accuracy, yeah. Any any other ones? Kind of chronology of events. Yes, chronology of events is really really important. A uh, oh, big part is the formal expository prose, right? So if you think about like a history book, it's told in this very like it's not in a narrative format, but it's rather in this like kind of a very proper academic technical explaining language, almost like a scientific kind of language, right? 
So it's not supposed to be entertaining. It's supposed to tell you something that's going on, right? And related to it is this kind of objective, uh, disinterested analysis. Uh, so right, you want to be objective and not biased. Because if you're biased, you're not going to be writing a good history. Uh, and so you want to try to paint the most accurate picture of what happened. Yeah. Good. Also, you're going to find this kind of critical engagement with both primary and secondary sources. So the, the chart here is a biography of Jonathan Edwards that I have in my apartment. And it's like three inches thick. It's probably super boring. I don't want to read it. Um, but if I were the biographer writing this biography on Jonathan Edwards, who is a Puritan preacher uh, in early American history, what kind of sources would I want to use? Well, I would want to think about like the sermons that he's preached, or perhaps uh, like letters he's written, or letters people have written to him, or maybe he has a diary. These are all primary sources that we use to inform our history. But at the same time, we want to use secondary sources, because uh, academic histories are engaging with what other scholars and what other historians have said about Edwards um, and what kind of how they've portrayed him. And so history is a conversation, and we're building on this set basis of knowledge, right? So we're going to engage with sources. And when we're engaging with sources, how do we cite the sources? APA. Yes, APA or MLA, right? We have this. Chicago. Chicago. So we, the, the, we have multiple developed, like, intense ways we cite sources. And we all learned them in middle school. We probably hated it. Um, it's super boring. But we have this, like, very set way. And it's like you do it in the footnotes, or you have these super long bibliographies. Um, and so we have a way, a set way of citing sources. And all these characteristics, these are the gold standard, right? Not all histories meet the standard. But this is what makes something a good history. So some people are going to plagiarize. right? They don't follow the standard of source uh, citing. That's not good. Uh, but they're falling short of the standard. OK, are we clear on the modern conventions of history? So these are, again, the modern conventions. right? So we're familiar with these because we live in modern times. And we have, we're familiar with the way people usually write history. But the issue here is that the Gospels uh, were not written in modern times. And History has been written down differently throughout history. So historiographic practices change throughout time. And so if the Gospels aren't written in modern times, we can't expect them to write their history in the same way that we write history now, right? And this should make sense like intuitively, right? Just people write how they know how to. Um, but it's really easy to forget about this when we're just sitting down and reading the Gospels by ourselves, because it's kind of this abstract point. And this is a danger, because if I approach an ancient work with a pair of like 21st century glasses on, reading a first century text, uh, I'm probably going to misinterpret the text, uh, draw incorrect conclusions, and fail to appreciate the actual value of the text, because I'm not looking at it from the right frame of mind. And so when we talk about the Gospels, the Gospel writers lived in the ancient Roman Empire. So we should expect them to write like ancient Romans and not like modern Americans. And so this means we have to look at the Gospels on their own terms and not on our arbitrary terms and not with our 21st century lenses. So we need to ask the questions, what are the biblical authors trying to do? How do they accomplish this? And how was this done in the first century? And so these questions mean we have to ask, OK, what genre are the Gospels? What genre do they operate in? And the Gospels fit in the genre called Greco-Roman biography. And so this is a uh, fairly uh, frequent form of uh, history we see in ancient Roman world, Greek world. And it's uh, scholarly consensus today that the Gospels fit into this genre. Uh, Craig Blomberg, who's a prominent conservative New Testament scholar, says, after nearly a century of scholarly debate, there is widespread agreement today that the Gospels are appropriately labeled as Greco-Roman biography. So the idea here is reading these ancient biographies can better help us understand how the Gospels operate and what kind of things they're trying to do. Does this make sense to everyone? All right, so what makes an ancient biography an ancient biography? Like, What uh, set things differentiate it between the modern ones? So the first thing is narrative prose. So unlike our modern, modern uh, biographies, uh, ancient biographies were written in a narrative format like a story. So the ancient biographers thought of themselves as some kind of storyteller. They're not trying to give a dry presentation of facts or like as it happened news report. They're trying to tell an interesting, true story. Uh, a second thing is they're going to be sourced from eyewitnesses. This was a uh, big thing in the ancient world. Um, they had a preference for people who had actually seen the events and been a part of the events. So Lucian, who's an ancient 
historian, writes a book called How to Write History. And this is actually uh, partly a satire of badly written history, in his opinion. And so he says, as to the facts themselves, the historian should not assemble them at random, but only after much laborious and painstaking investigation. It should be a preference for eyewitnesses, but if not, listen to those who tell the more impartial story. So the goal, the golden standard in ancient biography was to source from eyewitnesses. So a living and surviving voice, as I think Papias puts it. Also, you have these things called compositional devices. Uh, this is, we won't dive into this one too much. It's not super important right now. But basically, the idea is these ancient historians have uh, limitations we don't have today. And so they have to find ways to go around these limitations, like paraphrasing speeches or compressing things to fit in kind of a scroll format. And so ancient biographies looked a lot different than the ones today. And so when they're dealing with eyewitness sources, the question naturally is, OK, how do they cite those sources? Did they have ancient MLA? No, they didn't. They didn't have ancient MLA. Um, and so this is actually a really hard, difficult question to answer. So how do they cite their sources? Because we don't always know what the sources are, because we don't have a lot of ancient works. So we're trying to assume. So it's hard to know when they're quoting something when we don't have like, what they're quoting. Um, and so one scholar named John Marincola suggests he says, the overriding concern was with the narrative. It was impractical and intrusive for the author to interrupt his narrative constantly with I saw or I learned or I conjecture. In place of a barrage of first person remarks, historians use an arsenal of techniques implying opto autopsy or inquiry that contributed to and facilitated the flow of historical narrative. So the idea here is that the ancient historians, because they were concerned with the story, they didn't want to like, break the fourth wall and kind of say, I got this from so and so, because that would ruin kind of the narrative flow. So what they did was they used more subtle techniques. And so they had a tool bag of subtle techniques they used to source their information. So what were these techniques? Well, the first one suggested by John Marincola is the appearance of the historian within the narrative in the third person. So this is something like a Gospel of John, beloved disciple. We, he's a third person character in the narrative. But towards the end, we learn that he uh, wrote the Gospel, allegedly, right? And so this is, this is one uh, technique. Another one is noted by Richard Bauckham. And he says, the strategic occurrence of eyewitness names uh, within the personal narrative. So basically, the historians would mention uh, the, the witnesses' names at certain points in the narrative to let you know, OK, now I'm relying on this person for my testimony. So what does this look like in practice? So uh, we're going to turn to an example. And this is the crossing of the Rubicon. Uh, very famous event in uh, Plutarch's Life of Caesar. So Plutarch is a first and second century biographer and wrote prolifically. And so in this, in this case, he's writing about Julius Caesar and his crossing of the Rubicon. Is anyone familiar with the crossing of the Rubicon? OK. C can you tell me what, what, what basically was the idea of it? Why is it important? Uh, he, had, he was fighting elsewhere, and then the Senate told him not to come back. Yeah, so crossing the Rubicon was basically a declaration of war on the Roman Republic. And it kind of somersaulted events uh, to the overthrow of the Roman Republic eventually. And so uh, it's this really uh, important point. And what's interesting about the character of Julius Caesar is that he is not humble at all. He loves to write about himself and all his escapades in like the Gallic Wars. Uh, and so he loves to write about himself. But what's weird is he never writes about the Rubicon, which for something so important is a little bit strange. So how can we know the crossing the Rubicon actually happened? Ancient historians write about it all the time, like Plutarch and Suetonius. Uh, but where do they get this information if Caesar doesn't write about it? So let's look at the account. It says, um, Withdrawn in silence, Caesar spent a long time mentally torn between two alternatives. And even at this stage, uh, his intentions fluctuated wildly to and fro. Then he spent an equally long time voicing his doubts to those of his friends who were with him, who included uh, Asinius Polio, with a tally of all the troubles that crossing of the river would initiate for the whole world, and with reflections on how great of a tale it would be to subsequent generations. So there are two really interesting things about this account. Uh, the first thing is the way Caesar's portrayed, right? Usually in ancient works, Caesar's portrayed as this kind of uh, buff guy, really charismatic, always running into the fight. He's not portrayed this way here. 
uh, it seems like something the early audience might doubt. They might say, I know Caesar. He wouldn't be nervous here and questioning his decision. It's uncharacteristic in the way he's usually portrayed. The second thing is notice that weird parenthetical about his friends who are with him, oh, who included this one guy, uh, Asinius Polio. Why is that there? Any guesses? That's where we're getting this information from. Bingo, yeah. So we know that uh, this guy named uh, Asinius Polio was a uh, Roman senator uh, and a kind of, he collaborated with Caesar a lot. And he actually wrote his own memoirs uh, of this time. And from other places, we know that Plutarch is, is citing him uh, in this whole work. So what seems to be going on here is that Plutarch, knowing that uh, this portrayal of Caesar is out of character and readers might doubt it, he's uh, subtly reassuring the reader that he is a source that was present for the event and witnessed the event. Uh, and so you can be assured that this isn't made up. This is real. Does that make sense to everyone? What's and so this is uh, not isolated to Plutarch, but we see it all across other Greco-Roman histories. Uh, we see it in Josephus. He does it in some funny ways. Um, and all over the place. And so the question is, like, what's the point? When is Jesus going to come in? Like, oh, we haven't talked about the resurrection yet. The point is that since the Gospels are these ancient biographies, we need to analyze them as such, and they're going to cite their sources in much the same way as was customary in that literary genre, right? So the huge takeaway is this. When looking for source attributions in Greco-Roman biographies, we should watch for strategic placement of names within the narrative structure that indicate the mentioned character was present and witnessed an event. So we should look for certain names in the narrative and that also put an emphasis on the character being there and being a witness. So these are the two big things to have in your mind um, as we go on. OK, that's the first point. Now on to my second contention. And this will be pretty short, because we've already done a lot of the legwork for this. So when we talk about the Gospel of Mark, what is traditionally the source we think of? Well, usually we think the Gospel of Mark uh, has, the eyewitness behind it is Peter. And we think this because a guy named Papias in uh, the second, early second century said that Mark was Peter's scribe and kind of wrote down these events. And so traditionally, the church has assumed that Peter was the eyewitness source behind the Gospel of Mark. But this doesn't work for the resurrection because Peter drops out of the Gospel of Mark in Mark 14 after he denies Jesus. So Peter wasn't there to be an eyewitness for the resurrection. So if you're looking to say, oh yes, the Gospels are eyewitness testimony, you're going to have to say it's someone other than Peter because Peter wasn't there. So what we're seeing is a situa situation kind of analogous to the one with the Rubicon because just like Caesar, the, the main source isn't present for the event that's going on. So we need to look and see if the text gives any form of source attribution. And so if you look on the back of your handouts, you should see, uh, you should see this passage over here. So this is uh, Mark 16, the first verse, and then also skip down to the fourth verse. So it says, um, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that it may, might go and anoint him. When they looked up, they observed the stone, which is very large, had already been rolled back. And they entered the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe uh, standing, sitting on the side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has not been, he's been raised. He is not here. Look, uh, there is the place they laid him. But go to his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So reading this in light of the Plutarch account, what do we notice here? Name dropping, right? You have this, it doesn't just say the woman, it doesn't just say Mary and her friends. It says Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, right? So it's this meticulous identification, right? Anything else? John. Uh, it shows like the verbs that they were using, like they observed, they saw. Exactly. So you have the verbs that have to do with sight. And so not all of them just mean looking, some of them mean an, uh, an extended period of observation, like you're staring. So it has them, they're looking around, they're staring at the tomb, they're observing for an extended period of time. Um, and so what you have is the meticulous mention of the names and then the verbs which paint them as seeing the event. And so Richard Bauckham, the scholar who I'm basing this work off of, says, the emphasis on seeing becomes unmistakably a claim to eyewitness testimony when we remember the primacy of sight in the discussion of the eyewitnesses in ancient historiography. So Richard Bauckham says, this is unmistakably a claim to eyewitness testimony. 
And so if we compare uh, the Mark versus Plutarch, you can see kind of how they're very similar. Both instances uh, like are the critical point in the narrative. They're crucially important. Uh, both things kind of make the reader skeptical. Obviously, the resurrection is a little bit more doubt-inducing than Caesar being a little bit nervous, but it's the same kind of thing. And both of them have their chief narrator absent, and both seem to be indicating uh, their sources using narrative devices. So what we see in Mark fits exactly what we laid out um, after analyzing Plutarch. Are we good? Does this make sense to everyone? Does anyone think this is a stretch? Are ancient Jewish biographies the same as the ancient Greek or Roman ones? Because my understanding is those cultures are kind of distinct. Uh, so Josephus's operates the same way. So I had Josephus examples, but we had to cut them out. But the, um, the idea, so these are, they're written in Koine Greek, right? So the, the context, or the idea where you have a context like completely separate, like Judaism and uh, Greek, is not really what you see here. And they're clearly operating in a kind of Greek context. Yes, good question. So now I think we're in the next place. We can kind of respond to what McClellan says. Can anyone kind of see what the problem is with Dan McClellan's statement now? Does anyone want to tell me what the problem is? Oh, the lens is the issue. The lens that he's using. Exactly. So he's saying that there's no eyewitness accounts because there's no first person claims. But the issue is why should we limit the search to these first person claims when that's not how ancient biographers would have cited their sources? So he's kind of drawing this false equivocation here. And this is a problem. Um, and so I think Dan's point here is, is kind of off the mark. And we shouldn't be too concerned about what he's saying. OK. Yeah, that's the, that's the first point. So we're halfway there. But now, OK, so what, what, what if we say, OK, we have a claim to this eyewitness testimony. We have the Gospels are making this claim that they're sourced from eyewitnesses. What does this mean, though? Can we definitely claim that the resurrection accounts are now eyewitness testimony? Well, not so fast. Okay, so let's go through our classic example of Carol the Christian. Uh, let's say she goes through this whole argument comparing uh, you know, the Gospels to ancient biography and going through Plutarch and saying, OK, now, based on this, they're making a claim to testimony. And our friend Alvin the Atheist will say, this is, doesn't matter. This is irrelevant. Because whether or not the account, accounts portray themselves to be eyewitness testimony doesn't matter it's highly probable that the gospel authors lied about this eyewitness authority to add, credibility, to add credibility to their accounts. And so this makes sense, right? Because I can claim anything I want, but it doesn't make it true. And Alvin's point's actually really good because ancient biographers did frequently falsify claims to eyewitness testimony. Um, and so the question is, how can we be sure the gospels aren't just making a claim that they can't back up? Is there any way for us to, to kind of substantiate this and test out whether or not they're gonna, they can back up this claim. And so that's what the second half of my talk is going to be. And I'm going to be relying on uh, the work of N.T. Wright. And so now we're going to talk about whether the resurrection accounts are these kind of later additions to the Christian tradition. And I'll kind of talk about what I mean by this. Were they something that was kind of invented later as Christianity developed and kind of fictionalized and not really based on any eyewitness testimony? And so this is a very critical question. And so now we can do my third point, which is the synoptic accounts represent a very early form of Christian tradition. So not a late edition, but rather an early form of Christian tradition. So when we talk about Christian views on the resurrection, you have to engage with 1 Corinthians 15. So when we talk about the New Testament, the earliest writings in the New Testament are not the Gospels. The earliest writings are the Pauline epistles, or possibly maybe James, maybe earlier. But, um, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is talking about the whole chapter about the resurrection. And at the beginning, he cites a piece of oral testimony. So Paul is quoting something, not that he's writing down for himself, but something that he's been told and has been passed down through Christians. Uh, and so Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised, he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Um, so what you have here is a very, very early kind of Christian creed, a kind of uh, Christian evidence of a Christian belief in a resurrected Jesus. So the idea of a resurrection wasn't a late development. You cannot argue that the resurrection was kind of this late development because you have this very early creed that Paul is referring to here. But the question is, how does what we have in the Gospels relate to what this early belief is? Because you notice, this is kind of like a little bit vague. It's not super filled in. It's pretty short. It just says he was died, he was buried, uh, he appeared. 
And the Gospels are much more fleshed out than this. So where are they getting their information? Um, can it be that they're just kind of taking this and kind of filling in the gaps just on whatever they want to? Uh, so we have to ask the question, how does this relate to what's in the Gospels? And so one view is that of a guy named Rudolf Boltzmann. Uh, and so Rudolf uh, Boltzmann was this extremely prominent uh, theologian, New Testament scholar at the turn of the 20th century. And his views have been enormously influential in developing kind of the picture of how New Testament scholarship has looked over the last century. And so Boltman's view was that the appearance stories are these legends uh, created by the church for proving the resurrection and sanctioning the heathen mission. Uh, the story of the empty tomb came into being at a later stage as an apologetic legend to prove the physical resurrection of Jesus. So what Boltman's saying here is that they're kind of taking this, they're filling in the gaps to kind of justify uh, the expansion of the gospel, right? It's the, the idea to go and make disciples of all nations, right? And the empty tomb stories are legends that were made to prove Christianity. So he's saying they're a late addition and a late development. And so Boltman's view has been extremely influential uh, in modern New Testament scholarship, and a lot of people just take his conclusions and kind of assume them. And so can we trust Boltman's view? Well, before we do this, I want to make a quick clarification. So when I'm talking about early versus late, the issue is not whether the Gospels are written early or late in the first century. Like, that's interesting, but it's not really relevant right here. The issue is whether or not the resurrection traditions, as expressed in the Gospels, have a real basis in this early Christian testimony, or if there was something that was kind of developed and refined as Christian theology developed. So it's about sources, not dates. Hopefully that makes sense to people. Okay. So now, quick, quickly, we can stop talking about New Testament for a minute. We can talk about a general case of communication. So how does communication work between people? Uh, and so we've all, we're all familiar with the game telephone, right? We know how the game telephone works. So our friend Caleb will start out with a saying, and he'll tell Landry, uh, who will tell Julie, who will tell Sam, who will tell Michael, who will tell me. And by the time I hear it, instead of blah, 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 I'm hearing rah, rah, rah. T-A-M-C, right? And so we know how telephone works because like, people have their own ways of speech. They have accents, they mumble, they talk too fast like me. Um, and so things kind of get perverted as communication happens. Um, <laughs> and so it's not intentional. People aren't always intentionally trying to mess things up, but sometimes things just get heard wrong. And so this is just like a few quick phrases, right? This happens when people just repeat a sentence. But now imagine this happening instead of a phrase, but with a story. So things get a lot more complicated, right, with a whole story. So let's imagine how a story will get transmitted. So let's think Caleb, right here with this machete, comes up with a cool story, a baby about like he kills a tiger, or like something, something ridiculous. Uh, and he tells Landry. But the issue here is that Caleb's a really bad storyteller. And so he tells it boring. But when Landry hears it, he says, wow, that's a really cool story. And when he tells it to other people, he makes it way more interesting. So when Landry tells it, he's going to add like um, voices and kind of tell it much more energetically so people will kind of get invested in it. And then so Landry tells it to other people. And one of those is Julie. And Julie is a philosopher. And so she loves to add like a necessary interpretation. So like she'll add something about you know how Caleb fighting the tiger represents the triumph of man over beast, or you know something like that. And so this continues as Julie tells Sam, and Sam tells Michael, and then eventually tells me. And so as this happens, people are adding their own interpretation to the story. They're not changing it. They're not changing the facts, but the structure in which they tell it and the interpretation that they have kind of gets set according to the line, right? And so what Michael hears depends on what Sam tells. And what Sam tells depends on what he hears from Julie, right? And so it kind of goes down and down. Everyone's, what everyone tells depends on the other person. Um, so the question here is, when I hear the story, when I, when I tell it, will it be more similar to the way that I heard it from Michael? Or will it be more similar to the way that Caleb originally told it? What do you all think? The way Michael told it, right? Why? It's what I heard. It's what I'm basing it off of. That's the only way I know it. Because I don't know Caleb's story. All I know is Michael's story. And because my version depends on what Michael told me, because Michael is closest to me in like the interpretive train, in the chain of tradition, what I hear is going to be based on what Michael tells me. Okay. So we go with it. We wouldn't have this how this works. 
So now let's think about it, change it, and say, now I hear the story. The same thing happens, you know, Julie adds the interpretation, she tells Sam, she tells everyone, and I hear it from Michael. But then I say, that's a cool story, let me go ask Caleb, because I want to hear his take, because he was the one that was actually in it. So now, if I tell the story, which version will it be more similar to? If I'm hearing Michael's version and Caleb's version now. Yeah, right? But would we be surprised if it was different than Michael's? No, right? Because I'm not, now I have a more kind of source that's diving past all the layers of interpretation. And when people are interpreting the story, they're not trying to change it or falsify it. They're just adding their own ways of telling it. And so when I hear Cale's version, I hear the one that's kind of unfiltered, as it were. And so if I tell the story after this, it's going to probably sound a little bit different than Michael's. It's gonna, there's going to be difference. It's not going to look like my version depends on Michael's, probably. This, this kind of makes sense? This is like the idea of interpretation and how people kind of communicate over time in events. So now we can apply this thinking to the Gospels. Um, and so if you look on the back of your handout, you have this diagram. And so this is kind of uh, the late edition model that Boltman kind of working with here. So a late edition, the resurrection accounts are this kind of late fiction, right? And so on this model, what you have is Jesus dies, right? And the early church somehow begins to believe he was raised, right? You have this early tradition in 1 Corinthians 15. Early church thinks Jesus was raised. Not really a lot of details there, but that's, that's the belief, right? And then as Christianity spreads and oral tradition spreads, um, the stories get interpreted. And so you have people like Paul who aren't eyewitnesses interpreting the stories of Jesus, right? That's what the idea of 1 Corinthians 15 is. He's interpreting uh, what, the gospels, what the gospels mean, right? And so he's not trying to change it, he's just interpreting. And so every, over time, as you have Paul and other writers, you have this sense of resurrection theology begin to develop in the, in the, in the early church. And at, at this time, the gospels haven't been written yet. And so later, when the gospels writers sit down to write the resurrection accounts, they're going to write it based on what they know in the interpretive tradition, based on you know, what Paul says and what the, other, what the general church picture of resurrection means, right? So they're writing according to their tradition. So this is the example of when I'm hearing it from Michael. And so when I'm hearing it from Michael, my version of the story is going to sound closest to Michael. And so when the gospel writers uh, are writing the resurrection accounts, it's going to sound closest to the ones that they hear it from if uh, this is their kind of a late edition. Because you can't write outside of your context. You have to write inside your context. So if the resurrection accounts are a late edition, they should conform to the context and to the interpretive tradition in which they were written, right? And this should incorporate how the church viewed the resurrection in the first century. Does this make sense? Okay, now flip it towards the early source model. Uh, if, we think, if we think the, the gospel writers intentionally retrieved early eyewitness testimony, we wouldn't be that surprised if they didn't show signs of dependence on kind of, a hist um, kind of a, the way the church talks about it. Yeah, Cody. The late edition model, the reason why people say the Bible contradicts itself a lot? Possibly. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, people that would endorse like Boltman would definitely say the gospel, the, the gospels and the Bible contradict themselves. But uh, it's kind of a related issue, but not entirely the same. So, yeah. Um, and so if you have early, early, early source, um, we should expect it to not necessarily match and show signs of dependence on the way the early church was talking about the resurrection. It might be different, and we should expect that. We wouldn't expect it to be exactly the same on our early source model. Does this make sense? OK, so now the question is, what do we see? When we examine the Gospels in light of the way the early church was talking about the resurrection, do we find they match, or do we find discontinuity? And remember, if we find discontinuity between my version and Michael's version, or uh, the way the church talks about resurrection, and then the Gospels, this is kind of a big problem for the late edition model. It, it's not something the model would predict. So we have, to, we have to ask ourselves the question, do the stories match their interpretive tradition? And so there are three big red flags here that say that they don't really match. The first big red flag is the presence of the women. So this is, this is, a, bit, this is a big one. Uh, and so the idea here is that while it may seem strange to modern readers, the presence of a uh, woman in the, in, the, in the resurrection accounts would have been kind of weird to early, the early church in the early uh, Greco-Roman world, right? Because in the first century, women were not acceptable legal witnesses within a court of law. Uh, and so their testimony was considered to be unreliable. 
And we don't think this way now, but this is how they thought back then. And so it will be really strange for the gospel authors to invent uh, the testimony of women as their key eyewitnesses to the resurrection, right? This is the kind of thing that they would get made fun of by kind of the pagan world saying, oh, your, your religion is both a bunch of wives' tales by women, essentially. Um, and so adding women to the tradition, if it was a made-up thing, this would actually decrease the credibility of Christianity. As you see in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul doesn't mention the woman. So if this is a late addition, it's adding this. And this is not the kind of thing that would be added. And so in kind of New Testament studies, we call this the criterion of embarrassment. If a source has things in it that are embarrassing to the writer, it's probably true, because no one's going to write something that is going to embarrass them. Like, why would you make something up that's going to embarrass you? It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, and so N.T. Wright says it's frankly impossible to imagine that the women were inserted into the tradition in Paul's day. So it's not the kind of thing that will be added. It's a red flag for the late edition model. The second red flag is there's not a lot of Old Testament interpretation in the resurrection accounts. Uh, so if you've read the rest of the Gospels, uh, they're pretty commonly, you'll uh, hear, they're not shy about quoting scripture or alluding to scripture when they think that Jesus has fulfilled prophecy, right? So think about uh, like Matthew 1, you have, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So it's quoting prophecy because the early church believed that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, right? So they're not shy about that. And again, in Luke 3, uh, kind of John the Baptist uh, prepared the way for uh, Elijah, right? So this whole idea of prophecy interpreted. And they weren't shy about mentioning the prophecy. But we don't see this in the resurrection accounts, which is kind of weird. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, remember it said that uh, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So in the early church, the interpretive tradi tradition said that he was raised according to the scriptures. So we should expect on a late edition model for generally there to be some kind of reference or a direct scripture quotation. So in, Act, in Acts 2, right, you have this association with Psalm 16 as a resurrection proof text, right? So why isn't there Psalm 16 in the Gospels? This is a really weird question because we should expect the type of quotes based on how the rest of the Gospels work and how other like Jewish literature works. Um, so Wright says, from very early on, the early Christians developed a sophisticated uh, network of biblical exegesis to demonstrate that Jesus provided the, the fulfillment of Israel's hopes. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke have clearly believed this to be the case. They haven't told the story in a way that brought it out. So it's this continuity from the way the early church was talking about the resurrection. It's not the way the early church, yes? Just and the ends of Matthew, Mark, yes, and Luke, yes. Right? Okay. And those, yeah, so you know, and, and the isolation of the ends of those parts, yeah. The most you get is the road to Emmaus, when Jesus says all these things happen according to the scriptures, but we don't get a direct verse, the idea here, or any type of like a illusion. You just say it happened according to the scriptures. Okay, yeah, but what scriptures, right? So we should expect a scriptural quotes if we're operating on a late edition model. The third red flag is the absence of personal hope within the resurrection narratives. So the big idea for the resurrection for Paul is connected to the future Christian hope of a bodily resurrection, right? So whenever he talks about uh, the resurrection, like in 1 Corinthians 15, it's about how Christians had the hope of one day being raised like Christ. But this is not the emphasis in the Gospels. In the, in the Gospels, the, the big idea after Jesus is raised is, okay, Jesus has been raised from the dead, therefore we have work to do, right? Go make disciples of all nations, right? You have the Great Commission. There's work to do to evangelize the nations. Not, oh yeah, Jesus is raised, so I'm raised too. The Gospels don't emphasize that. That's emphasized by Paul. So the early church was talking and saying, okay, this is what the resurrection means. This is what it means for us. They had these ways of interpreting it. This is not how the Gospels talk about the resurrection. So there's this continuity, which is not what we would expect given the late edition model. So what you have here overall, what this means is you have this weird emphasis on the woman, right? That would have been embarrassing. You have a refusal to use this kind of biblical embroidery and to quote scripture, which is not what you would expect. And you would have... Uh, a strange lack of the emphasis on the Christian hope, which was so typical of early Pauline church writings. So on a late edition model, we would expect none of these characteristics. This is like me hearing a story from Michael and then repeating something that's completely different than Michael. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and so N.T. Wright says, the strong probability is that when Matthew, Luke, and John describe the risen Jesus, they are writing down a very early oral tradition representing the three different ways the participants told the stories. 
So if we say that they're intentionally trying to retrieve early testimony, this discontinuity between how the church talks about resurrection and how it's expressed in the Gospels makes sense because uh, they're kind of trying to dive past all the later levels of interpretation. This makes sense to everyone? Okay, cool. So this is, this is the, the, the big thing, right? So if you look at the whole, the whole picture, uh, the Gospels seem to be indicating, seem to be trying to tell us, uh, seem to be indicating that they're eyewitness testimony because of their use of narrative uh, sourcing devices, right? Um, and also at the same time, it seems like these are very early Christian texts and not subject to kind of this like gradual uh, fictionalization, right? So it seems like when you have these two data points, it seems likely uh, reasonable to conclude that the resurrection actually um, has faithful adaptations of eyewitness testimony. Um, and so this seems like a, a fairly, fairly the best conclusion we can make of what the facts are. So it seems like we have early eyewitness testimony of the Easter events. Now, granted, this does not get you to the resurrection, right? This just gets you to eyewitness testimony. N.T. Wright says, the stories exhibit exactly that surface tension, which with, we associate not with same fiction, uh, and therefore anxious to make everything look right, but with the hurried, puzzled accounts of those who have seen something with their uh, own eyes, which took them horribly by surprise, and with which they have not yet fully come to terms. So the idea of the gospel resurrection accounts is it's portraying the way the eyewitnesses experience the resurrection, the, the surprise, the fear, the hope that they, that, that they got. And so there are these kind of raw texts, and that's what we should look for when examining the resurrection accounts. Um, the hurried, puzzled accounts. And this is a really good way to view the resurrection accounts. I, li I like Wright's quote here. And so again, this does not prove the resurrection, but it's key evidence in that discussion, right? So uh, it's key, key evidence if you think, okay, we have eyewitness testimony of people that thought they saw the risen Jesus, and they interpret it in this way. It's pretty, it's a, it's, you need more explanation, but a good conclusion is that it's reasonable to believe that the eyewitnesses saw the risen Jesus. So. In summary, takeaways, in typical uh, fashion, as was practiced in the ancient world, the synoptic gospels indicate their sources using narrative devices. Secondly, uh, materials within the synoptic resurrection accounts indicate that they were not later additions or expansions to the Christian tradition. They're outside the way the early church talked about resurrection. Um, and the conclusion, therefore, it's likely that the synoptic resurrection accounts are relatively faithful representations of the way early Christians told their stories. Any questions? Any, any points where y'all think I'm, I'm kind of off here? Julie. Did you get to discuss this with Molly Worthen? No. She read, well, we, she we, right? we briefly discussed it um, on Monday morning, yeah. But it wasn't like super in depth. Yeah. But yeah, this is, this is perfect because the Molly the Worthen like, primed it perfectly. Because she talked about, oh yeah, N.T. Wright and Richard Bauckham, which are the people that I sourced for this. So, any other questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, have you read uh, anything related to the philosopher uh, Hans George Goddard? Because it sounds like he would be, he would be interested in his work based off of your comments about tradition. No, I haven't. Testimony. You might really like that. I would recommend looking into it. Yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yes. Tell, tell me about the same after so I can write it down and look yeah. into it. Sweet. All right, well, if there's no more questions, you don't think I'm like off on any major areas, that's good. Katie? What about the temple? What, what about the temple? I mean, a lot of people try to argue that they can't have even been written like after 70. And it seems like both models are assuming they're written down after 70. But the so, temple is destroyed in 70. Why didn't any of them mention it with the fulfillment of Christ's prophecy? Yeah, this is a good question about the temple. Um, so the question of dates, I, I'm kind of assuming for argument that they're written post-70. Um, but the issue with the, the temple, it's really interesting because a lot of people a priori will date the Gospels after 70 because the temple, it prophesied the destruction of the temple, uh, and therefore it has to be after the temple was destroyed because, you know, they can't actually make prophecy. But this is, it, it doesn't follow. Even some atheist scholars will say, like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Uh, you, you can still, they can still make a guess. Um, and so I'm pretty agnostic on the question of dates. I'll just probably go with what the mainstream says because I don't think it is too super important. But yeah. I'm a little bit confused about how exactly we're saying that uh, parts of the gospel are do in fact 
correspond to, I guess, late additions or at the very least late <coughs> habits okay. um, of, of the early church. For example, the em embroidery, embroiderization of oh, yeah. scripture with all these okay. Old Testament references. So we know that that is, I guess, a later feature. Mm -hmm. of, but the... Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I, I get your point. The, the idea here is that, okay, why do we have these, I, these places in the Gospels where they're more theologically embroidered and then we're saying it's completely different than the resurrection? Yeah, and, and if we have noticed a difference, yeah. uh, how do we assign priority to one or the other? Yeah, so the, the response that kind of is right, that Wright gives here and that I would follow is that uh, these are the critical points in the Gospel narrative. So that the evangelists, when they write it down, are wanting to avoid any kind of uh, theologization that will kind of make it seem less trustworthy. And so this is what they're intentionally trying to preserve this testimony. And since the other parts of the Gospels, it's not as critical, they're okay with kind of putting in the prophecy and interpreting it in that way. But because the resurrection is so pivotal, they're going to treat it a little bit differently. Is that, is that it? Yeah, Colin. Um, I'm reading through John right now on my own. And I was just kind of curious, like, when compared to, like, the synoptics, like, what are the big things about John that makes it, like, I don't know, I guess less reliable, or like, why didn't you include it in the argument? Yeah, okay, so there's a lot of weird things in John, uh, like, because John actually claims to be written by an eyewitness, right? It says in the ending, like, the person who witnessed who these things are true testifies, right? But this is actually really difficult, because some people will say this isn't original to John, some say it's a later edition uh, after, and some think that it's actually written by a community, not by one person. Um, and so there's a really good reason for, for thinking that the ending is original to the text and not a later edition. Um, but like it's a whole kind of rabbit hole you have to chase and talk about like which John wrote it and that kind of stuff. Um, and so that, that's why it's kind of like, it's not, it's not less reliable, but it's just weirder. Uh, and so when it's weirder, it means like just more rabbit trails that I didn't want to chase. But yeah, great question. Yes. So let's, uh, for instance, Matthew yes. uh, may or may not have been written by an eyewitness. Right. Uh, but you would also make a distinction, I suppose, that not everything in the Gospel of Matthew, whether or not it was written by an eyewitness, is eyewitness testimony. Yes. Because there's this distinction from the Gospel. Uh, I guess that's not a question. Just clarification. Yeah, so like maybe some parts were by eyewitnesses, but everyone's not present for everything. And certainly, uh, not many of the gospel writers are present at the very beginning of the tomb, right? They come there later, but they're not there for the initial. So they have to be, all of them have to be relying on someone else for at least the first part. Um, and so there, are, uh, the, the the key thing here is I, I don't want I I kind of strayed away from the question of the dates or who's wrote who thing because. Either way, it's not super, it's kind of tangential to this whole discussion. So, good, good, good question and comment. All right, if there's nothing else, then I think we're good. Everyone, thanks for coming. This is awesome. Hopefully, uh, it was beneficial. <laughs>